my name is Maria Estrada and I work in uh, equity, diversity and inclusion within the environmental movement. And what I want to talk about today is unconscious bias because in my work, what I've discovered is that unconscious bias is one of the biggest barriers to getting to equity in the work that I do. So I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to get uh, the definition of bias out of the way and talk about how you uh, make a conscious, manage for it, and, and try to you know, modify your behavior. And then the second part of the presentation will be about how this touches down on my work within uh, the environmental field. So very quickly, a definition of bias. Bias is judgments and assessments that come at us really quickly and without conscious understanding, and they are triggered by cues in the environment. The other thing that's important about bias is that they infect our uh, perception, they infect our behaviors, and they infect our memories. And so if they are left um, unchecked, uh, if we're not aware of biases, they can be very dangerous. So I'm going to give you an example of how I discovered one of my own biases. And this happened in an airplane. I spend a lot of time in airplanes because of my work. And it um, happened about two years ago uh, when I was uh, you know, getting ready, settling in for a flight across the country to the East Coast. And the voice of the captain came on, and it was the voice of a a woman. And I got butterflies in my stomach. Now mind you, I have a love-hate relationship with airplanes. I don't, I'm not, the, you know, I'm not comfortable anyway. However, I had never had that sort of uh, gut reaction, you know, if it was the voice of a man. And, you know, to be quite frank with you, uh, when the going got rough and the going got bumpy, I was really worried about whether the woman who was on the front seat was competent and knew what she was doing. Now, I'm being this honest and vulnerable with you because all of us have biases. And um, the challenge is to, uh, to be aware of them so that we can change them. So most of us move through our days thinking that we make decisions that are part of a conscious, and logic process of deliberation. Um, but what they, uh, and that we cannot do things that are contrary to our values without knowing that we've done so. However, what the science of um, unconscious bias is telling us is that all of us, well-meaning people, are unwittingly accomplices in perpetuating a system of inequity, right? So, um, back, back to my example, you know, there is a reason why um, I have a bias uh, against, uh, I had a bias, and I'll tell you uh, the rest of the story later, but I have a bias um, against, you know, women captains of airliners. Um, and that is that all my life, all I saw uh, were male pilots, right? For me, the association in my mind about who is a competent pilot, it's an older, ex-military, white um, male. And um, so what I want to do that now is tell you how um, biases come to be. So just very quickly, reviewing what I just said, biases are rapid and automatic. We don't know that they happen. All of us have them, even though we don't know it. Um, they are contrary to our conscious beliefs and value systems. And if left unchecked, they can be very dangerous. Now, where do they come from? So, we, when we walk uh, in the world, ev at, at every moment in our lives, our bodies are sending about 10 million bits of information to our brains. And the conscious mind is only capable of processing about 50 bits, right? 11 million that you get from your senses, from your body into your brain, and your conscious mind can only process 50. So what does the brain do to cope? The brain is really good at compressing. Our brains are really good 
at scanning the environment and looking for, for repeating patterns. And what happens when the brain finds those patterns, it files them away unconsciously without you noticing. And it does it without concern for whether those uh, patterns are accurate, whether they are useful, and whether they are fair. Okay? So, in the back of your mind, there is a vast reservoir of these associations. In fact, a lifetime's worth of these associations. And we pull from there unconsciously when we react to the world, when we make meaning of the world. Okay? So, I do this presentation uh, for my organization quite a bit, and I've started to do an experiment in Google. So I've been Googling these associations, and what I look at are the images that come back. Um, and I want to show you what I found out, because I've learned about uh, how media is not benign, and that's where we're getting this, uh, you know, repeated patterns of associations that our brain is filing away. So this is a Google search that I did on both female and executive. And what Google does when it pulls from the index, the ginormous index, it looks for the most accurate information, right? So I, I take a, a screenshot of the first page that appears. And what I'm reading, the association there is that executives Female executives are young, they're attractive, they're fit, and they're white. Let me give you another example. I did this one, neurosurgeon. So what is coming at me? Who is a neurosurgeon, a competent one? It's a white male, middle age. Commander, again. White, middle age, male, for the most part. Engineer. There seems to be a stereotype of a person outside with a hard hat that's a male, that is young, that is fit, and that is mostly white. There's a few women in the picture. I hope you're getting the point. This one really stunned me. CEO, right? That is the association that is being fed by the media. And your brains unknowingly are constantly filing that away. And that's where you pull from when you are making meaning of the world. So back to my example, right? Airline pilot. I put that picture there because I want to make the point that my bias is not unfounded, right? That's the message that I got throughout my life. And so my idea of competence is a white, as I said, white, ex-military, older, male. Now, I'm going to touch a little bit on how do we, you know, manage and, and work with our biases, make them um, conscious, and, uh, and try to overcome them. Although it is very difficult, right? Because they are unintentional, we have no awareness of them, so the process of controlling them is not straightforward. So, that picture on the left and the right is the same woman, Captain Tammy Jo Schultz. I don't know if any of you recognize that name, but this is the highly competent captain of an airliner in Southwest. It landed a uh, plane that had blue an engine. This was back in April and the debris cracked the window and an individual was sucked out. I don't know if you remember, but there are recordings of her response and, you know, the moments between the accident and the landing. And this woman has been praised for remaining calm and, and being incredibly skillful in bringing that um, plane, uh, landing it safely with, uh, you know, a couple hundred people. So because I had I identified this, this bias, I went chasing this story. I was just fascinated and I wanted to know everything about uh, this woman, so I read everything I could get my hands on. And what I found is that she lived in New Mexico when she was little. And she, they lived near an um, air base, um, uh, Air Force base. And she um, would look at the planes uh, and dream about being a pilot since she was 11 years old. 
And during high school, she went to a career fair, uh, and there was a lecture by an ex-military pilot. Um, and as she was walking in the room, this man, this role model uh, to the kids that were there for career fair, asked her, are you lost? And then the next thing that, she, that he said to her was, this is career day, not hobby day. And, you know, I invite you to Google the Time, particularly the Time Magazine story about Tammy Jo Schultz, where she tells, you know, the story of the adversity that she faced uh, in wanting to be a pilot. Nevertheless, she persevered, right? And uh, she was one of the first uh, uh, women who served in the Navy after the ban had been lifted for women to fly planes for the Navy. And you know, what I realized is that they won't hand an airliner with hundreds of people in it to anybody. You have to do your work to get there. And what I found out by reading about her story is that she is highly competent. And unfortunately, there is only 6% women who fly airliners because of the story I just told you, because they had to overcome a lot of adversity in a male-dominated field. So before I go into how this touches down in the environmental field, I do want to leave you with what you can do in order to work on your own biases. Remember, we all have them. And you have to learn how to read your environment for these sort of associations and catch your fast reactions you know, when you're responding to your environment in ways that feel like you know, a gut feeling the way I had it in that airplane. You want to entertain other possibilities, right? And so that's why I was so intrigued by this woman who had landed this airplane that was in trouble, right? I wanted to entertain that possibility that women are indeed capable of flying big, big airplanes. Uh, you want to ask questions. And most of all, you want to refocus on an individual situation instead of you know, thinking that an individual can speak for an entire group of people or can represent an entire group of people. So now to you know, my own field. So I went looking for what is environmentalism and who is an environmentalist, right? In my work about equity, diversity, and inclusion in the environment. And you know, what I found is that environmentalism is about trees, it's about you know, the planet, it's about plants, and it seems like nothing else. And environmentalists are the tree huggers. And again, they are white and they're middle class. And, you know, I don't see anybody who looks like me, you know, in the definition of an environmentalist. And there's a consequence for the way that we understand environmentalism and envir environmentalists. These are the people who run the biggest environmental organizations in the U.S. Again, you can see the pattern. Right? So there is, there is power in our biases and there are consequences. And these are the results of us having accepted a definition of the em environment and environmentalists as people who protect you know, the planet and you know, environmentalists only being uh, white people. Are there people of color in the environmental movement? Absolutely. I, this is my work. This is the work that I do. This is what I try to bring awareness around. The, the women that you see in the picture are leaders in the environmental movement, in the environmental justice movement, right? So there is a fragmentation between the mainstream environmental movement that I just showed you and the environmental justice movement. And I will tell you a little bit about that difference. And, you know, I, I will bring this to a close. But the woman, the picture in black and white is Harriet Tubman. And if you don't know about her, she escaped slavery. And then she went back and she led, they think, about 15 rescue missions where she took, you know, enslaved people across the forests, you know, through the underground uh, railroad to safety. And she did it under the cover of night, you know, by navigating the forests and the rivers. So this woman had a deep understanding of nature. Um, however, she used that understanding in the pursuit of justice. 
The woman on the top left is Dr. Dorsetta Taylor, who wrote a groundbreaking report about the state of diversity in the environmental movement. And she's the one calling attention to what I'm sharing with you today, that there are not enough people who look like me in the environmental movement and there's in the mainstream environmental movement, and we need to do something about that. Rue Mapp is there. I heard her a couple of days ago uh, when I was in Oakland. She's a founder of something called Outdoor Afro. There are leaders of Outdoor Afro across uh, cities in the U.S. and they partner with relevant organizations on the ground, on the ground to take African Americans safely into nature. Because as Dr. Caroline Finney, who wrote a book called Black Faces, White Spaces, has written, African American people, given you know the history of enslavement and what I just shared with you about Harriet Tubman, don't feel safe in the environment. You know, trees might, you know, evoke a history of lynching for African Americans. So all these women are doing beautiful work within the environmental movement in service of justice, um, social justice. My work also takes me to work with Latinx communities across the U.S. and I have met plenty of organizations run by Latinos, Latinas, Latinx groups in the U.S. who are galvanizing the community to act for climate change. And I also work with indigenous groups because we need more than any other group the uh, wisdom of uh, indigenous groups in the U.S. in order to take us to uh, victory uh, within the environmental justice movement. So um, I hope that I've, uh, I've made a point that there are consequences uh, from bias within the environmental movement. There is fragmentation and, you know, um, my work and what I think about and occupies my mind all the time is how do we bridge the fragmentation between the mainstream environmental movement and the uh, uh, environmental justice uh, movement. And I would love to engage in conversation. Thank you very much.